the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Well, as you know by now, the theme of our conference is the Bible and spiritual warfare, God's Word and the transformation of culture. All three of us, Michael, Brandt, and me, are, have focused our lives upon sacred scripture. In my case, I came to it as a young adult, fresh out of juvenile court, as an evangelical Protestant, soon to become a strong anti-Catholic. Because the Bible was, for me, early on, the spiritual roadmap that would lead me home to heaven. And don't get me wrong, I'm very grateful for the formation that I received back then in many respects. And as a Catholic now of more than a quarter of a century, I'm even more grateful for the gift of sacred scripture. But I want to propose to you that for us as Catholics, scripture is more than a spiritual roadmap. Because what we have in this special treasure is a revelation of what well, we could call it God's plan of salvation. And I use those words deliberately because what do they abbreviate? God's plan of salvation. GPS, that's what sacred scripture is for us. <laughs> Have you ever tried to read a road map in the middle of rush hour or at night, especially with crying kids in the back seat? It's kind of hard. It's easy to get lost. And it's hard to find your way once you're lost because you're not sure where you are in the map. But in our case, we have a living voice from on high that takes the word of God that we find in sacred scripture and guides us, just like GPS technology, something that I came late to after getting lost many, many times. It's sort of like satellite technology only more because we have this heavenly voice that guides us it's still quite easy to read it and get lost in our lives. But the one thing about GPS, I don't know about yours, but it always says recalculating. <laughs> <laughs> That's what it's like to have living tradition. That's what it li it's like to have the divine authority of the magisterium. That's what it's like to be alive at this point in history and to recognize that the word of God is still powerful enough to transform culture, but that the word of God is not reducible to sacred scripture. It comes to us in scripture and in the living tradition that we most especially find in the sacred liturgy, in the sacramental life of our worship as the family of God. That's why we're focusing so much of our material this day and tomorrow on how the word of God transforms culture and how the Bible points the way for us as Catholics at this point in history. Because the meaning of history is practically impossible for people to grasp. I was just in Israel a week ago. And you can see the different views of history from the Palestinians and the Muslims, the Jews and the Christians. And then as you go out, you can see that the Assyrians and the Jordanese and you know, the Jordanians, all of these other people have their own take because they have their own national ethnic heritage. But for us as Catholic Christians, whether we're Anglos or Hispanics and everything else in between, the meaning of history comes down to 33 years. And the significance of those 33 years can really be boiled down to three years. But then those three years can be further reduced to those three days. And those three days can be still reduced to those three hours upon the cross. And finally, we can see that the hinge on which history turns can be identified in just three words. It is finished. Because the battle has been won. It was a world war from the beginning. And the first world war is what we lost in the garden. But the last world war has already been won for us. The mop-up operations are messy. And we're in the middle of one of the messiest in history. Because we're caught in a pincer movement, aren't we? On the one hand, the sexual revolution is bearing some of the worst fruits we could have imagined in redefining one of God's greatest gifts to his human family, sacred matrimony. On the other hand, I was just in the Middle East, and we recognized the other part of the pincer movement coming from the other side, and that is militant Islam. That is not just in the Middle East or in Europe, but it's come to our shores, and it's going to continue growing. And it's a religion of divine slavery, self-described. I'm reminded of what Proverbs 17 says, that the diligent slave will rule over the delinquent son. 
because ours is a religion of divine sonship. But when children are outserved by slaves, slaves will rule children. Until those sons and daughters wake up and realize that we have got to outserve the mere servants, that we have got to outlive, outlove, and outdie them. And in the same moment, we cannot, we don't have to begrudge them for their radical commitment. We ought to be more radically committed. I was admiring how their public worship at specific times of the day, not just the soul but the body, not just bowing the head but prostrations, not just the women but the men. No wonder they're revealing to the world the transforming power of religion. But I am convinced that our faith has a civilization-forming power and potential that we have yet to see. And so, what has the Vicar of Christ revealed to us in these last few years? The new evangelization. What is it? Just another curial program so that the diocese near us can create a new office and a new committee and publish new documents? No. This represents our marching orders. As the Militia Christi, the army of Christ, we have to obey. We have to obey, and we have to respond every day. Now, you've been hearing this phrase, the new evangelization, a lot. Two years ago, almost exactly, Pope Benedict announced that the 13th Synod of Bishops would convene in the Vatican in October of 2012 to focus on what? The new evangelization. And then four months later, on June 28th of that year, the Feast of Saints Peter and Paul, he announced the establishment of a new dicastery in the Roman Curia, which was the Pontifical Council for promoting the new evangelization. And then last year, in October, all of these bishops met and discussed strategies to implement the new evangelization worldwide. But the new evangelization didn't arise just in the last two years. It has been unfolding in a very specific way. And that's why in this year of faith, which began on October 11th, 2012, which was the 50th anniversary of the beginning of Vatican II, we have our bearings. We can have a frame of reference. Because when you look back on the 16 documents of Vatican II, you discover the Catholic faith. Not watered down, not distorted, not diluted, but presented in a compelling way. At least that's how I found it when I was still far from the church and I read through those documents. But after the council, there was great chaos. And the more you study church history, the more you realize that practically, after every council, practically speaking, there is chaos. People are warring over how to interpret and implement the teachings of whatever council just happened. But when you look at the documents of Vatican II and compare them to the documents of Vatican I, one thing is striking. In Vatican I, the term evangelization, the term evangel, good news, occurred one time with reference to the four evangelists, the Gospels. Whereas in the documents of Vatican II, the term evangelize, evangelizing, evangelization, occur 206 times, more than in all the previous conciliar documents put together. And so taking his cue from Vatican II, as soon as it concluded in 1965, Pope Paul VI picked up the theme of evangelization and ran with it by giving it even greater emphasis. In fact, he was asked, why did you choose the name of Paul? We haven't had a pope by that name in centuries. And he explained that his desire was to pattern his ministry after the great apostle to the Gentiles, which he then enacted by becoming the very first pope in human history to make apostolic journeys to other continents, which he began doing in the middle of Vatican II by coming to America in 1964, as well as the Holy Land and India in 65. And then in 65 and 66, he went to Portugal and Turkey in 67, to Colombia, Uganda in 68, 69, Iran, East Pakistan, the Philippines, West Samoa, Australia, Indonesia, Hong Kong, and Sri Lanka, all the countries that he'd visited by 1970. And then two years after Vatican II ended, he reorganized the Roman bureaucracy and changed the name of the Congregation for the Propagation of the Faith to the Congregation for the Evangelization of Peoples. 
By the mid-70s, he convened a synod of bishops around the world to focus on evangeliz evangelization in the modern world. And then in 75, he published what many consider to be the most important document of the concluding years of his ministry, Evangelii Nunciandi, on evangelization in the modern world. And in this document, he states his thesis quite clearly and boldly. He declared that the most basic duty of the church is to evangelize the world. Quote, evangelization is in fact the grace and vocation most proper to the church, her deepest identity. She exists in order to evangelize. Now, what Paul VI accomplished was soon overshadowed by Pope John Paul II, blessed John Paul, John Paul the Great, because he became the greatest <laughs> globe-trotting pope ever who eclipsed the record-setting travels of Paul VI. He became pope in 78, and he began his travels in 79. His first trip was back to his homeland, Poland. And there he used the phrase for the very first time, new evangelization. Paul VI described evangelization all the time, but he never used the phrase new evangelization. When John Paul went to Nova Huta in his own homeland of Poland, this town that had been designed by the communists to be a worker's paradise, which turned out to be more like a nightmare, he was speaking to tens of thousands of his fellow Poles about their plight and what it would take to overcome the oppression and how it was more than political, more than economic. The solution had to be spiritual. What would it take? He said a new evangelization to renew the faith and spiritual identity of his own fellow countrymen. And that's when he used the phrase for the very first time, but he didn't employ it again for a few years. It wasn't until 1983 when he came back to America and spoke to all of the bishops of the Latin American Episcopal Conference at Port-au-Prince, Haiti, in 1983. And that's when he basically threw down the gauntlet. He issued a challenge. He gave them a call. He announced the new evangelization on March 9th, 1983, when he was speaking to these bishops about what would the future of the Americas be. But in 83, he announced that the new evangelization would be officially launched, not the next day, not even the next year, but the next decade. Nine years later, in 1992, that would represent the official launch date of the new evangelization. And why? He explained. Because 1992 would mark the 500th anniversary of, guess what? The founding and the first evangelizing of the Americas, going all the way back to 1492 when Columbus sailed the ocean blue. And so he went on to explain how this would determine the future of the Americas based on how we would respond to this call. Before 1992 arrived, however, John Paul had already begun to prepare the church around the world and especially in the Americas. In 1990, he published an encyclical, Redemptoris Missio, the mission of the Redeemer, in which he stated his thesis that the new evangelization represented the single most important call for the church. Let me quote from that document. Quote, I sense that the moment has come to commit all of the church's energies to the new evangelization. No believer in Christ, no institution of the church can avoid this supreme duty to proclaim Christ to all peoples. As part of the preparation for the launch of the new evangelization, he went on to announce that the next World Youth Day would be held where? In Denver, Colorado, of all places. And all the critics began to wag their tongues and their pens, criticizing the Pope's decision. Why? Because it is a certain failure. The previous World Youth Days had been held in places like Buenos Aires, Chestahova, Rome, Santiago de Compostela, countries that with with a, a large, a predominant Catholic population and a long tradition of Catholic pilgrimages. And American youth are just simply too secular and sophisticated to even be bothered with what that pope had to say to them. And so a number of journalists had pre-written article drafts when they arrived at Mile High Stadium in 1993. And then they all had to crumble them up and rewrite them as the Pope's helicopter circled Mile High Stadium, visibly buffeted 
by the forceful waves of applause and screams of love and greeting that came from over a million pilgrims who ended up coming to World Youth Day. It was a turning point for the church in the U.S., for the church of the Americas, and for the church throughout the whole world. But 1992, just one year before, he also did something. At the very beginning, the first half of 92, he gave a talk that was published in the official Vatican newspaper, L'Observatore Romano, entitled quite simply, Base the New Evangelization on the Eucharist. I remember reading it wondering, how would that work? Because as evangelicals who evangelized, we never saw the Eucharist with even the purview of what we would do in sharing the good news. Throughout that decade, you might recall, John Paul II described the 90s as the Advent season of the new evangelization. I remember hearing him say that several times, but it never sank in. Because what that implied was something that most people missed. If the last decade of the 20th century represented the Advent season of the new evangelization, what is the season of Advent compared to the rest of the liturgical calendar? It's basically four weeks out of 52. In other words, when you're done with the 90s, by the analogy, you've got 48 more weeks to go after you've covered four. In other words, the new evangelization was never intended to be a short-term project, some sort of interim strategy to sort of reinvigorate you know, a dying Catholic population in certain quarters of the world. This was a long-term commitment. This was a long-term plan. This was a long-term strategy. And very few people noticed that. But one person who did, back then was named Ratzinger. <laughs> we know him today, of course, as Benedict XVI. And it's interesting because Ratzinger picked up on the two priorities of the new evangelization that John Paul would always say. John Paul identified the two main priorities for the new evangelization. Primary evangelization has been going on for 2,000 years without ceasing. And that is presenting Jesus to those who have never heard of him before, presenting the gospel to those who have never encountered Christ. But the new evangelization is what he identified with the, second, the secondary form. And that is re-evangelization is required, as he put it, wherever Christians have lost a living sense of the faith and no longer consider themselves living members of the church. Gee, I, I wonder what he's talking about. It's an amazing fact, not only in the U.S., but throughout the Americas and throughout the West, that there are you know, not one stray sheep for whom the shepherd leaves the 99 to find, but more like 99 stray sheep that the shepherd has to go and track down. There are thousands, hundreds of thousands, millions, tens of millions of fallen away Catholics. And so the new evangelization is new, not because Catholics have begun to evangelize for the first time, as one cynical commentator put it, but because the new evangelization is targeting those who are non-practicing, those who have fallen away. Listen to the words of Pope Benedict in Verbum Domini as he echoes John Paul. At the dawn of the third millennium, not only are there still many peoples who have not come to know the gospel, but a great many Christians who need to have the word of God once more persuasively proclaimed to them. Many of our brothers and sisters are, quote, baptized, but not evangelized. Huh. In a number of cases, na nations once rich in faith and vocations have lost their identity under the influence of secularized culture. And then he concludes, the, new, the need for the new evangelization, so deeply felt by my venerable predecessor, must be valiantly reaffirmed in the certainty that God's word is effective. Benedict understood what many people didn't, that the new evangelization was intended from the outset to be a long-term strategy that would carry us across the threshold of the millennium into the 21st century, into the third millennium, and most likely well beyond our own lifetimes, if the analogy of Advent season applies. So this is something for us, for our children, and now for my eight grandchildren. 
It's exciting. It's challenging. But it's not easy. But it is a divine project. So what is new about the new evangelization? Both Blessed John Paul and Benedict have made it clear. First of all, it's not just for the clergy. It's not just for the religious. It's not just for the missionaries. It's for each and every one of us. Second of all, it isn't just evangelizing those who've never heard. It's evangelizing the baptized. It's re-evangelizing the de-Christianized. The third distinctive feature of the new evangelization is that it's not just about a one-time event, a conversion, like I had you know, when I was barely 14. It isn't a one-time event like a conversion that I had back in 86 upon entering the Catholic Church. The new evangelization is about conversion that is ongoing. It's ever-deepening. It's lifelong. It's not just for individual conversion, fourthly. It's for the evangelization of culture. It's for the transformation of culture. Because what has it been that brought about the de-Christianizing of so many people? Secularization. The culture of death cannot be overcome simply by evangelizing individuals. It has to come about, as John Paul and Benedict have said, through the evangelization of culture. We have got to overcome a culture of death with a culture of life. And there is no other way. So this is the fourth and very important distinctive. A fifth distinction is that the goal is not just a mass of individuals have converted or are still converting. It is to bring about what, again, John Paul and Benedict have described as a civilization of love. And as they've reminded us again and again, civilization passes by way of the family. And the family passes by way of marriage. And marriage passes by way of covenant faithfulness and commitment. So a civilization of love that is rooted and grounded in the marital covenant and the love of the family, as well as, and this is the last point, the Eucharist. Going back to 92, when John Paul made it clear that we must base the Eucharist, we must base the new evangelization on the Eucharist. We've heard many times how the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the Christian life. But for the vicars of Christ, our generals, our commanders-in-chief, the Eucharist is also the source and the summit of the new evangelization. And in just a few moments, I want to look at how that works. Because it isn't as easy as it might sound on the surface. Before I look at that, though, I want to just take a step back and ask ourselves, okay, what is it that causes Catholics to resist evangelizing? What is it that causes them to sometimes be reluctant or to come up with excuses not to? Well, there are two objections that I hear frequently. One of them is Catholics are content not to evangelize because that's what the evangelicals do. <laughs> so let's let the evangelicals evangelize, and then we will use Catholic apologetics to turn their converts into ours. <laughs> Been there, done that. <laughs> kind of feel like the poster child. Now, such a two-step process is not uncommon or undesirable, but I would propose to you that we need to follow the lead of the vicars of Christ, John, Paul, and Benedict, and cut out the middleman, so to speak. Don't get me wrong. I don't think we should begrudge the evangelicals for their evangelization. I just think that we ought to pick up the torch and run with them and then go beyond them. There's nothing contradictory about an evangelical Catholic. For a lot of Catholics, that sounds like an oxymoron. Evangelical Catholic, that's like a married bachelor. <laughs> no, it's not. The more we grasp the inner logic of love that makes us Catholics, the more we're going to realize that the good news is simply too good to hoard it to ourselves. In fact, I would propose to you that evangelical Catholic, far from being contradictory, is a virtual redundancy. Being evangelical is what it really means to be Catholic. We really don't add anything to Catholic when we call someone an evangelical Catholic. We're just saying they're faithful and consistent in following the word of God and the vicar of Christ. Another common objection that I run into a lot, especially at Franciscan University, where you find a lot of followers of St. Francis of Assisi, are the famous words of this great Italian saint who is so 
who supposedly said to his friars, what? Preach the gospel at all times, and when necessary, use words. Yeah. <laughs> so these folks, I suppose, would prefer to evangelize simply through the witness of their lives, without words. Now, how do you respond to that? Well, first of all, as I said, I teach at Franciscan University of Steubenville. So many of my friends and colleagues are Franciscans, theologians, philosophers, and also historians. And the Franciscan historians tell me that you can look all you want, but you will search in vain to actually find where St. Francis ever said those words. <laughs> that is a medieval urban myth. <laughs> a nice legend. But the fact is, it does a good job of sort of summarizing or encapsulating much of Francis's lifestyle. Because his life was really more about deeds than simply words. And so we can still hide behind that if we want, but I would say look more closely at St. Francis and realize, you know, look at his life of holiness, of love and sacrifice. Is your life, is my life really up to that standard? so that we wouldn't have to speak words. All people would need to do is just look at my life and that will be compelling enough to convert them. Before you answer that question regarding yourself, <laughs> check with your spouse <laughs> or your siblings and coworkers because not even someone as holy as Francis went without words. And not only Francis, but Francis' is master our Lord Jesus. There, if anyone lived a life that would have been so compelling as to convert people without words, it was Jesus. But what did he do? He united his deeds with his words, and so we should, and so Francis did. And so will anybody who wants to be a saint. And so we really don't have any excuse, but at the same time, we make excuses. And so I want to just address two or three impediments that I still think stand in the way of ordinary Catholics evangelizing. First of all, I think people tend to associate evangelizing with fundamentalists, right? And so we associate it with this particular form of Christianity that is anti-Catholic, that can be very emotional, sometimes manipulative. Just turn on the television and you can see. It's a kind of isolated spiritual ghetto. And at the same time, it's fraught with scandal and hypocrisy. Besides, we Catholics live in America, not as fundamentalists, but as Americans. And in America, religion is a private matter. And most of us are content to leave it that way, except for the vicars of Christ and Jesus himself. Amen.